everyone, Candace Marison here. Welcome. We are so excited today to have you with us online. If this is your first time, leave a comment or get a hold of us by message or email. We want to thank you for joining us. We want you to know we are here for you. Reach out to us by phone, email. We'd love to pray with you. Just talk um, and just be encouraged uh, with one another. We have some awesome ways to get connected here at BCC still. We have online Zoom coffee hour with Pastor Phil, which has been a great time. BCC kids and our youth. We also have some Zoom meetups that are a blast. We play games, we share Bible stories. We do a lot of fun things. Also, I wanna thank you all for your support and prayers during all this. We are feeling the love and our food pantry is reaching our communities and it has been such a blessing. This is a unique time. Parents, you are doing a great job. This is hard. This is new for us. There isn't anything we can really go back on that is exactly like this. So I wanna encourage you, you're doing great. And we unite and we take things one day at a time. This verse I was thinking on this week, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It goes on to say, by gazing upon Christ, we become more like Him by a work of God's Spirit. As we take time today and worship, let's take that time, that moment to gaze on Christ and just feel that peace, His mercy and His love and His encouragement and joy that He has for us. His goodness is in that gaze. So join with us as we worship. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. All souls are by the blood of the Lamb, I'm not a slave to what once held me damned. How beautiful that cleansing flood. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in blood. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Whoa, 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 I am a child of God. Right. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bounds I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Is the flow that makes me 
makes me white as snow. No other founts I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am dressed. Oh, precious.
this night. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiance in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror.
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I Splitting the sea for us, Father God, and you're showing us the other side. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for your provision and for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, believers. I am excited to be here with you this morning, and uh, thank you for wor worshiping with us. Worship team always does a great job. Um, I'm Ben Durant. This is my, my beautiful <laughs> wife, Brandy. And uh, we want to share a message with you around honoring God. I'm going to start with Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Uh, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You know, honoring God is something that has been threaded throughout all of, all of Scripture. You know, a few examples are, um, you know, Adam and Eve in, in the garden when God said, this is all yours, but I want you to honor me by, by leaving this one tree. Don't eat from this one tree. You know, and then Abraham um, gave one of the very first uh, offerings to uh, Melchizedek. And, uh, um, you know, and then Moses, you know, under, under the law in Israel, um, in that season of life, they, they um, you know, dictated a tithe. And, uh, you know, it's... it's it, the great thing about about honoring God in the different ways that we do honor God is it, it creates that that closeness with God and it gives us a way to stay connected. And uh, Brandy's going to share a little bit more with you on that. Uh, hello, believers. Um, I loved how Ben walked through the different parts of the Bible that talked about honoring God. And I think the big thing that stuck out to me was just the piece that under the new covenant, uh, we're no longer required to tie. That's an option. It's an invitation that God gives us. And it just makes me wonder, every time I see a difference between the Old and the New Covenant, like why is there the need for that change? God is very intentional in everything he does, so there has to be a reason why he's, he changed that. And what I think it is, is I think it's because he wants our heart to change. You know, when we're mandated by law to do something, we may change our actions, but we don't necessarily change our heart. And I think this quarantine that we're all under right now is a prime example of that. You know, we're mandated by law to stay in our homes and not to travel and do all these things. And a lot of people um, can perceive that as an inconvenience. They can be angry, frustrated, sad. And uh, so their hearts haven't changed. Their actions may have changed, but not their heart. And so it makes me, it leads me to believe that God is really looking for the heart change. And so that's why he gives us tithing as an invitation um, versus mandates it. And so I think that we can see that throughout scripture. And I think that tithing is just one of the ways that we can give back to God and that we can um, do be obedient to him so that we can get the plenty that he was talking about. Our barns can be overflowing. Um, we were kind of joking about that, that that's not necessarily for this time period of the, we're not in the agrarian age anymore, but you know, our, our finances can be blessed and our families can be blessed and we can, we can reap all the benefits of that just by giving back. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Ben uh, to give an offering or to give a blessing over the offering. All right, let's pray. 
Uh, Father in heaven, I just thank you for, for everything that you uh, you continually do in our lives, and uh, you know I, I thank you for the tithes and offerings that are continually brought into the this church to uh, um, to bless others and to bless the community. And, and I just ask that you pour out that blessing um, you know, over over the entire congregation. You know all the brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, you know the business owners, the entrepreneurs, the um, just that all your all your children within this congregation and uh, give them the opportunity through that to to go out and bless the world and shine your light into the world and thank you and love you in Jesus name amen Hello and good morning. This is Pastor Phil. Thank you for joining us this morning. I am so excited to be with you. Uh, worship was great. Thank you, worship team. And thank you, Ben and Brandy, for the encouragement. As you can tell, and maybe even tell by the sound of the echo behind me, I'm not joining you today from our church, at least where we currently meet. But instead, I am right here in the future location, our future gathering space, uh, recording because I wanted to remind you as you can see in the background there's some progress and though we're delayed the dream has not died thank you for your contribution both in prayer and your continued support uh, I believe not only is this going to come to pass but it's going to come sooner than later and I wanted to just join you from a different spot and, and share on uh, today's continued message comfort is lying to you Last week, our friend, Pastor Seth, did an amazing job. I mean, all I needed him to do was to hit a base run, and he knocked it out of the park. I feel like the momentum that he left me with made it super easy. Like, I'm just getting into the slip or the drift, if you will. And today, as I continue on this conversation, I pray that you are encouraged and stirred and provoked as we confront this idea of comfort. Comfort is lying to you. Now let's dive right in. We talk about comfort. Many of us find excuses, ways, ideas, thoughts. Some of us are waiting for motivation. I want to say it to you this way. Motivation is a myth. If you're waiting for a feeling, if you're waiting for motivation, if you are waiting for the infamous time to be just right, you're going to be waiting for a while. And if you're waiting for motivation or passion to show up before you actually take that step, you're gonna be waiting for a while. Here in Michigan, it's uh, coming upon what we might call here bonfire season. And we've had a couple of bonfires in our backyard already, and it's nice to be outside and enjoying the spring, soon coming uh, summer weather. But if you wanna have a bonfire and have that fire, you know, built up and, and flare up or become brighter, produce more heat, you, you need to first put on a log. You need to put some kindling on there. You need to put a piece of wood or something on there that will light that fire up and get it burning hotter. The same is true for you feeling motivation or passion. If you want to feel fired up, you must first add to the fire. You must take that first step. In order for you to, to, to get excited about it, and passion is great, it's what keeps us motivated, it keeps us stirred up when, when we see the results, but many of us are waiting to feel that before we take the step. Now let's go a little layer deeper. What keeps us? Why would we not do that? I think it comes down to one word. The word is risk. We don't want to take a risk of looking foolish. 
We don't want to take a risk of not having all of the answers. We don't want to take a risk of, of the unknown or revealing that we don't have all that it takes in order to accomplish it. I, I've heard people misquote the, the a, a verse in Corinthians that says, God will never give you more than you can handle. That is not true, and that is not what the scripture says. It says that God will never lead you into temptation greater than what you can handle. But I've learned from experience, and some of you can testify, God absolutely gives us more than we can handle. But he doesn't leave it in our hands to do alone. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Let me, let me share a quote with you from uh, the late Jim Rohn. Jim, Jim Rohn famously said it this way, If you think that trying is risky, just wait until they give you the bill for not trying. Many of us are, are afraid to take that risk, that step, that action, because we're afraid of what possibly could go wrong. But if we stand back and do nothing, the cost is so much greater than what we could become, what we could produce, how God could use you and how God could use me to not just make my life better, but how to influence a community, a nation, even, even the world. I know that sounds big, but changing the world starts with one changed mind. And that's my prayer for you today, that this would help us to shift from one way of thinking, to shift from embracing comfort like it's our friend, because it's not. Friends don't lie to you, and comfort is, in fact, lying to each one of us. The fifth book in the New Testament is the book called Acts. It comes right after John. It's the, the birthing of the modern day or the New Testament church. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is having a conversation with his ministry team. You, you, I'm sure that you know at this point that he's already resurrected. He spent many days with people, and he's having a conversation with his team before he ascends. I touched on this just for a moment a couple weeks ago, but I want to emphasize what he was saying to them because I'm going back to risk. Why don't we risk? Because we don't want to take a chance and, and do something that we don't have the skill set or the ability to do. Well, Jesus was telling these 12, uh, well, 11, to, to go do something that they didn't have the ability to do, but he encouraged them in verse number eight of Acts chapter one. Look with me. He, Jesus says, but you will receive power. Look at the person sitting next to you and say power. Even if you're watching this alone, say out loud, power. Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He, he said that, look, I'm going to send you out to do something that you're incapable of in your own strength. But I'm not going to lend you or lead you out into this, this environment, into these spaces in your own ability. I'm going to give you, he said, the Holy Spirit. And when he comes upon you, you're going to receive power. The word power in, the, in that Greek language in which the text is written is the word deutimus. Deutimus literally translates the power to do the miraculous. Now, before you get weirded out because I start talking about miraculous, yes, it's true. The Holy Spirit is power to do signs and wonders and miraculous feats. And I don't mean to overly simplify this, but let's face it. Isn't it true that anything that you could not do in your normal, natural ability and now can, that makes it a miracle? And so whatever it is that's stirring within you, whatever it is that you're wrestling with, the thing that's trying to keep you from, or, uh, the comfort's trying to keep you from engaging, you have dudamus, the Holy Spirit power to take that step of faith. This past week, I was hanging out with my friend Ben, and you just heard from Ben and his wife Brandy as they were talking about our offering this week. But when we get together, we typically are talking about things that we're experiencing, dreaming about, uh, people that we value, whether they're ministries or ministry gifts or pastors or speakers that are both accomplishing things or speaking things into our lives. We also enjoy talking about people in the marketplace that are doing great things, not just to build a company, but to build people. And uh, and we were, as we were kind of bantering back and forth, we both agreed that one of the ways that we stay very idle and the deception that comes in this space is when we think within ourselves that talking about a thing is the same as doing a thing. It's weird how that gets in there, but somehow in our minds, if I'm talking about it, well, I must be really moving forward or accomplishing it. And that's not altogether true. And without hesitation, Ben says, 
there's a reason why it's called the book of Acts and not the book of God's will. It stopped me in my tracks. Did, did you hear what he just said? It's, not, it's called the book of Acts, not the book of God's will. What's that mean, you might be thinking? The will of God was already spoken by Jesus in the end of Matthew. He told them to go. He commissioned them. It was the great commandment. And now the book of Acts is the apostles empowered by the Holy Spirit to take action. The same is true for you and the same is true for me. I'm empowered, you're empowered to act, to step outside of familiar, to move forward against the comfort into the spaces that God has called us to. We might be used to being in the shallow end, but God's calling you to the deep end where you can't touch bottom and it's risky. But if we will take that step of faith, what we will find is that he's capable of keeping us from drowning. Oh, that was awesome. I wanted to share that with you. The Christian life, whether you're a Christian or you're a non-Christian, is a life of challenge and struggle. If you're watching today and you put two fingers on your neck, you know, where you find your pulse, if you have a pulse, you're reassured that in this life you're going to have challenges. But what separates the Christian from the non-Christian is the empowerment provided by the Holy Spirit. It's the empowerment not only to lean in, not only to confront, but to overcome every one of the challenges that life brings. And there's a big difference, Christian or non-Christian. But I'm, let me just talk to you who identify as Christians. There is a vast difference between just being alive and living. Just eking by or surviving as opposed to thriving. And the message of Jesus— it's found in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, that you might live. But he didn't stop there. He says, I've come that you might have life and have it in abundance. The abundant life is the life that shows up when we press against the lie of comfort. When we take that act, that step of faith that's needed. This is powerful. This was worth giving thought to. And I'm praying that it's finding you right where you're at, because I think that this is a divinely timed message, that there are people watching today that within you, there's an unction. Yet there's a duality because you're still nervous or scared. Well, part of the secret sauce and the thrill of life is stepping out into the unknown. It's the inner child within you. The young boy or the young girl with that was, that's within you. There was this adventurous heart. You were born with it to explore and allow curiosity to show you what life is all about. Over time, if we're not careful or not diligent or disciplined, layers of doubt, concern, fear, comforts begin to cover up that inner adventurous child within. And that I pray even right now that my voice, my prayer would reach into that little child and shake it. Stir it up, and not allow that thing to settle, but to be the, the one who would explore again the very possibilities of what's out there. Comfort is lying to you. Let's talk a little bit about comfort and the danger of it. The truth is that most of us are comfortable enough with our conditions that we settle. We're comfortable enough with what we know and what we're familiar with. There's an old saying, perhaps you've heard it before. This was the most PG version that I could share with you. It simply goes like this. I've heard it said, the devil that you know is better than the devil that you don't know. In other words, I may not be altogether happy. I may not be thrilled. I may not be excited. This isn't the life that I dreamed of as a child, but at least I know what I'm in for. And what a terrible way to live. It's a fear that keeps you from walking through the door. Because on the other side of the door is the unknown. It's the fear that keeps you from taking that path. Because along that path might be some things that you've never experienced before. So let me ask you, friend, are you settling for the discomfort, the, the lack of, ex, uh, of exposure because you're familiar? Well, perhaps you're just surviving. But something within you, I pray, is, is, is screaming to come out the gift, the purpose of God in you because it's in there. We're all born with it. God has gifted you. He's given you a purpose. And when you don't use that gift or that purpose to the level that he intended you to, 
that's only empowered by his spirit, something within us starts to, to die. I know that sounds dramatic, but when you're not doing what you're gifted to do and called to do, it starts creating a terrible internal story within our minds. You know, the sinister thing about, about comfort is the excuses that come with it. You see, excuses will actually strengthen your comfort. Let me explain. Maybe you had a rough childhood. Or maybe you had a, uh, a marriage that failed or is failing. M- maybe you had a business that is struggling or it bankrupted, or you were part of a, a church that failed or a pastor that did something bad or a church that split. And, and so the excuse is, I'm going to stay back here in familiar. I'm going to stay here with my perceived safety because I'm not going to allow myself to experience that kind of discomfort or that kind of pain again. And it's true. If you risk stepping out, you may feel the pain again. You may feel the discomfort. But I want to, I want to encourage you. God doesn't want to just bring us to these areas for his sadistic benefit. If he brings you to confront pain, it's because he wants you to overcome it. And when you overcome a thing, it changes who you are. Whether I like to admit it or not, perhaps whether you like to admit it or not, the times in my life that I had some of the most disappointments, uh, some of the most discouraging and uncomfortable times, when I overcame, if I'm honest and I do an autopsy of that entire event, I'm actually stronger. I'm better for it today. I wonder if you could say the same thing. So it's true, you may have to hit that pain, hit that disappointment head on, but you're not going to stop there if we're empowered with Deutimus, the, the miraculous power of God, to keep going, to keep growing. Because the person who overcomes has a substance to give and to help others. If I am rescued, if I'm in the boat, I'm now capable of throwing out a lifeline to others who perhaps are drowning as well. Look with me at James chapter 1. As I get ready to read this verse, I, I just want to talk to you about he, the, the language here. Because James is pretty forward. He's talking about pain. He's talking about discomfort. The truth is, discomfort is your friend. Pain is your friend. And that's not just some macho talk. That's real. Many of us have to get to the level of discomfort that I will not put up with it any longer in order to do something different. So in that way, discomfort is helping you. Pain is a gift from God. Pain tells you that you're doing something that's wrong. Pain pain isn't there to say, don't do it. Pain is there to say, adjust. Don't do it that way. And when you change your form, you change your direction, you change the method, Now it's there to be a boundary. It teaches you not to do it that way. Pain is not there to cause you to stop. It's there to cause you to change the way that you're currently doing it. Now, if you think about discomfort and challenge through these lenses, now we can read James 1, 12 in a whole different light. James chapter 1, verse number 12, he writes, Anyone who meets a testing challenge head on and manages to stick it out is mighty fortunate. He's fortunate. You're fortunate for hitting these challenges head on. Why? For such persons loyally, in love with God, the reward is life and more life. Your reward for overcoming this is not just surviving, but really thriving. Life and more life. It starts with the mindset. Now, there's countless amount of books that you can read on mindset. There's you know, uh, motivational speakers that can talk about mindset. But it's true. This is a spiritual truth that you need to grab a hold of because the mindset and how we approach things is what's going to determine our outcome. Let's begin as we start talking about some mindset things. Number one, don't confuse comfort with peace. Don't confuse comfort with peace. Comfort's outside. Comfort is sensory. Peace is internal. Joy is internal. I I jokingly tell my friends down south that I'm wired for the south. I'm just called to the north. And and what I mean by that is that I love hot weather. I love long summers. Don't get me wrong. I love the summer here in Michigan. But in my mind, it can't be too hot. I've heard people say, well, I like it because it's a dry heat or it's a humid heat. I like it all. 
I love heat. So when, when I look at it through the lenses of the winters here in Michigan, and I'm in a cold environment, sure, it makes me uncomfortable. But it doesn't have to rob away my peace. It doesn't have to rob away from my joy. The comfort is the outside things. And the truth is, the Spirit of God, who Jesus gave as a gift to you and I, is, is called the comforter. Why on earth would we need a comforter? To help us in the seasons of, you guessed it, discomfort. God has called us to do things that are difficult, that are hard, that are going to make us uncomfortable. So we have the Holy Spirit who is our comforter while doing the things that are challenging our heart. The Apostle Paul writes it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16. This is the message translation. He writes, so we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. This is awesome. Grace in this, in this, in the scripture is not just unmerited favor. It's part of it for sure, but grace is also his ability. And so internally, um, I'm strong. Internally, I'm encouraged. Internally, I'm at peace and the joy of the Lord is my strength, even though outwardly I'm facing some discomfort. This is good stuff because life here is, is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's the long race. And when you, when you and I, we get too, I don't know, micro-minded, we get our blinders on and we, try, we start thinking that everything in life has to happen right now and it's going to be, whatever's happening right now is my new forever. That's just not true. Life is a long race. So there's some things that we need to learn about our mindset that's going to help us to go the distance. I wrote down a couple things. We need to learn how to rest and not quit. If you're feeling tired, rest, but don't quit. Additionally, we need to learn how to train our minds to keep going. If we are reminded that life is a marathon, if you've ever watched a marathon or even participated in one, there's people lined up along the path, the route. They're cheering on the racers, the runners. Why? Because it's hard and their bodies are hurting and they're, they're, they're feeling the effects of it. And so there's people cheering them on, letting them know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay off. They're going to make it. You know, there's a, there's a powerful illustration here that I don't want to go any further until I touch on. This right here is, is one of the most powerful reasons for the local church. You need people in your life that are going to cheer you on, not pull you down. When life gets hard, I want people to rally around me and shout at me and let me know I'm going to make it. Let's go back to the race now again. After certain mile markers, the fatigue begins to set in. Have you noticed that there's people with their hands stuck out, they're handing out water? They don't give them a jug or a gallon or a bucket. They just give them a little, a little glass, a little, little cup. And they shoot that glass of water back and it refreshes them and they keep going for another few miles. Having the right mindset, having the right things set up in your life is like taking that that shot of cold water that refreshes you in the moment so that I can keep going. I'm hurting right now. This feels painful. I don't see the finish line yet. I just need something to refresh me. So we need these tools, especially around our mindsets. You, You see this in the United States Marine Corps among all of their super awesome and and, uh, uh, super boss statements and and sayings, this probably rakes right up there with my favorite. It simply goes like this. Pain is just weakness leaving the body. Man, I just want to start, I mean, I just feel more manly saying it. I feel tougher saying it. Pain is just weakness leaving the body. What are they doing? They're trying to help the, the Marines to have a mindset that pain is not telling you to stop. Pain is showing you that you're getting stronger. It's a mindset that allows them to do things that most of us could never accomplish. There's a spiritual reality to this as well. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12. The writer puts it this way, beginning in verse number one. He says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blazed the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, 
who both began and finished this race we're in. So study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. Man, that's good. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. And that's good. Let me give you an illustration to talk about how mindset is powerful. If you're a farmer or you're familiar with farming or even to some degree planting a garden, there's a process that you have to go through in order to get the yield or harvest that you want. We're just coming out of winter here in Michigan and so the ground is hard. In order to begin, the farmers have to go out and plow up that hard, settled, crusty ground. When you're plowing a field, it takes more horsepower. It takes a longer time. You can't do it fast. It's a lot of work. It takes more fuel. It's always the hardest at the beginning. For you and I, it's always going to be hardest when we start. If I know that up front, if I am aware of that in the, in, the, in the very beginning, I'm not gonna be as apt to quit because each process gets a little bit easier. When the farmer's done plowing, the next phase is raking it or disking it. It breaks up those chunks and it's, you can go a little bit faster. It doesn't require as much horsepower. The fuel consumption isn't as great. Well, then comes the planting. Well, this is exciting because you're finally putting something into the ground that you know is gonna yield a harvest or bring some return or nourishment to you. And so we put that seed in and then there's a waiting process. In that season, we're praying and thanking God for what he's bringing, but harvest comes. And harvest is a super important time for the farmer or the person who's planted a garden. For the farmer specifically, they will work from daylight to dark and beyond. They'll work six and seven days throughout the week to get that harvest in because this is where they're gonna make their livelihood. This is where the resource is gonna come in for all of the hard work they planted. All the hard work rather they put into it. Let me just point out something that maybe we don't think about. Harvest is just as much work as any other process, but our mindset is different. It's because we're getting something for it. It's just as hard on the body. It's just as hard on the mind. It's just as hard of a process. We still need to use equipment to get it done, but because we're bringing it in and we're seeing it, it doesn't have the same effect. So there's a lesson to be learned about stress and maybe the stress that you're feeling. Let me share this statement with you. Stress does not come from facts. Otherwise, the same effect of the hardship of any other part of a process would be bogging you down just as much as when you're harvesting your crop. So stress does not come from facts. Stress comes from the meaning that you associate to it. That's powerful. That means that you have a part to play. That means that you can change the way that it's affecting you. Let me, let me begin to wrap it up with, with these final thoughts. I believe that each person watching today has a gift and a purpose within them. I believe at some level, uh, we are tackling hard spaces. But I also know that in my life, and I'm pretty confident in yours, that God is challenging some comforting areas, some spaces that we are holding on to where we think there's safety in it. But the reality is, it's keeping us from doing what God's called us to do. And we need a new level of confidence in the Holy Spirit. The comforter shows up when we go into spaces that we're uncomfortable in. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we could not do in our own ability. I've heard people for years misquote a, a verse from Corinthians. They say it this way. They say that, that God will never give you more than you can handle. And that is not true. In fact, that's absolutely opposite of what happens. The scripture actually says that God will never put or allow a sin to come on you or tempt you greater than you can, than you can handle or without giving you a way out. But as far as God putting things on you that you are greater than you or outside your ability, that's kind of how God rolls. And he doesn't expect you to try to figure it out and do it on your own strength or ability, but he does expect us to tap into his power. If you've never given your, your life uh, to Jesus, meaning that a surrender, saying, God, I, I know there's more in me. I know that there's got to be more for my life. 
and I feel like I'm the worst enemy of all. Like I'm the one who's sabotaging, which is the reality for most of us. I want to invite you that this isn't just a religion. This isn't about just a church affiliation. This isn't about an encounter with a living God who loves you, who died for you, and then provided a, a, a power source, a Holy Spirit, to live a life that's very different, radically different. And that life that's different is intended to serve others. That what you become, you begin, you begin to produce. You overflow the goodness of God. You reflect his work on you, and you begin to serve others. It's the life I, I'm living. It's the life that many of you are living. And I just want to make sure that each person watching today knows that it's available. So let, let me pray this prayer with you. Father, help me to be one that would surrender today. That I would, by faith, choose Jesus as my Savior. That I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm making a decision that from this moment forward, I want to follow you. I want to see what's possible every time you challenge me to step into a space that's scary, that's risky, that is in the deep end, that I'm incapable of doing on my own. Empower me now by your Holy Spirit to live a life that is supernatural. I yield my natural, you provide the super, and my life becomes radically different. Thank you for joy and peace that's our strength. And as we face these areas that challenge our comfort, we overcome every one of them in Jesus' name. And if you believe it, say amen.